R be redefined? The meaning of R be transformed or altered? How would digital and online work respond to the common questions, such as disappearance of artistic aura, the rupture of the on-site context, and or the singular or the singularity of R? Many art institutions strive to con convert temporary lockdown and limitation to highly create an interactive sharing that trigger empathy and bringing and bring healing effect. Art has the power to bring emotional, intellectual, and creative values to our life. During the COVID-19 pandemic period, C Lab.
최이사님과 관계자분들께 진심으로 다시 한번 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 아울러 어려운 시기임에도 본 포럼에 참석하시어서 지혜를 나누어 주신 국내외 발제자와 토론자분들께도 진심으로 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 올해로 열 번째를 맞이한 ACC 창작공간 네트워크 포럼은 그간 아시아 각국의 창작 공간들과의 협력을 통해 당대 문화예술의 담론에 대해 공론의 장을 형성하는 기능을 해왔습니다. 특히나 오늘 개최되는 포럼은 이 포럼 10년 역사상 처음으로 대만 시랩과 공동 주최를 통해서 온라인으로 개최되기에 더욱 뜻깊습니다. 존경하는 내외 기빈 여러분, 지금 전 세계는 코로나 바이러스의 세계적 유해, 대유행이라는 21세기 유례없는 재난 상황에 놓여 있습니다. 우리가 마주한 이 세계적 사건은 전 세계 여러 방면에 영향을 끼치고 있고 이는 문화예술도 마찬가지입니다. 봉쇄 중심의 방역 정책으로 인해서 전 세계 많은 문화예술 기관들이 휴관과 개관을 반복하고 계획되어 있던 대부분의 문화예술 행사들이 취소되거나 축소되었습니다. 이 과정에서 예술 생태계가 무너지고 많은 창작 공간들이 문을 닫게 되었으며 예술인들이 한계에 마주해 있는 상황입니다. 그러나 예술은 늘 위기 속에서 창조되고 가치를 더합니다. 전 세계 예술인들은 이러한 현실에 안주하지 않고 활발히 대안을 찾아 나가고 있습니다. 오늘 포럼에서는 아시아 창작 공간들의 이러한 대안적 움직임에 주목하고 예술이 가지고 있는 회복 탄력성에 대해서 이야기하고자 합니다. 아무쪼록 2020 ACC 창작 공간 네트워크 포럼이 우리 모두에게 영감을 줄수 있는 매우 생산적인 토론을 이끌어내고 포스트 코로나 시대 문화예술이 나아갈 방향을 제시해 줄수 있는 소중한 기회가 되기를 바랍니다. 감사합니다. 여러분, As the co-organizer of AASN annual event, we are pleased to work with Asia Cultural Center to facilitate the annual conference. Both CLAB and ACC ACI are public in institutions with the same mission to support arts and cultural development. CLAB aims to promote cultural innovation and to increase public engagement in cultural affairs. Since its inception in 2018, CLAB has been supporting arts and cultural innovation, experimentation, exhibition performances, learning and research programs. We highly recognize the vision of AASN to build up a strong network among Asian art spaces and institutions, and we look forward to its flourishing into solid collaboration and partnership. Due to the global pandemic, the 2020 AASN Annual Conference is taking place through live broadcast with concept of resilience and art. CLAB and ACC ACI joining invite opinion leaders from Asia Pacific area to exchange experiences to share proactive strategies to evaluate the impact and to predict the future of our world and cultural ecology. In light of this, we propose resilient art, Asian art space revival movement in the post-pandemic era as the subject theme of 2020 AASN annual conference. On behalf of CLAB, I welcome the participation from colleagues in this event and I look forward to the future collaboration with all of you. Best wishes from Taipei, and thank you. Can I? 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 Can
会看起来很紧张的样子吗？嗨，啊、um, ，It's my honor to work with、uh, Director Gipio Lee of ACI、uh, this time、uh, for the conference, the international conference online. And it's also my privilege to share with you the practice of C Lab for、uh, during this pandemic era. Since human civilization entering the 21st century. We have been facing a new age full of cha challenges. In addition to the drastic social, political, and economic changes, the strike back of the nature has issued a series of warning and threat to the survival of all human beings. Since the outbreak of COVID-19 earlier this year, the pandemic has not slowed down its pace. Currently, over 41 million people are in are infected. With over one million deaths, billions of people are in lockdown or fighting the pandemic on the front line. This March, World Health Organization made an official announcement, labeling COVID-19 as a global pandemic. Until today, quarantine, lockdown, stoppage, and mitigation seems to be the most common terms for our daily life. Most arts and cultural venues announced the announced the. Around the world, like museums and theaters, are temporarily shut down. Live activities, including e exhibitions, performances, seminars, and international travels, have been reduced, postponed, or canceled. As uncertainties cast over the operation and development of arts and cultural environments, on April 15, the World Art Day, Director General of UNESCO, Ms. Audrey Ozelay, reiter. Reiterated in her speech that during the most difficult time, art has the power of comforting people as well as the proactive function to unite, to connect, and to heal. In order to highlight the, si the re resilience and energy of art, UNESCO simultaneously launched the Resilient Art Movement. This movement brought together renowned artists and professionals from, ar from around the world. Mobilizing collective intelligence for resilience of art, drawing attention to the need in the middle in the, this time of crisis, and addressing important issues of cultural equity and access for art to to all. Compared to the devastation of the pandemic around the world, Taiwanese government has implemented effective policy to control the spread. And to minimize the impact on people's daily life, until now, the government has yet to impose lockdown in any region or cities. Arts organizations in Taiwan have not been shut down so far. Nevertheless, many activities were cancelled, reduced, or postponed. Our professionals are are encouraged to further refine their work or making respond to the crisis. Facing the impact of COVID-19 on the industry, Ministry of Culture in Taiwan has proposed a pandemic prevention policy and relief plans for individual and group art practitioners. These include subsidy for art production and operational losses, the issue of art fund coupon to encourage cultural consumption and to stimulate the industry, to organize large-scale creative. Events. So, in the slides, you will see、uh, two of our、uh, minister. That will be the minister, minister of、uh, culture, and our digital minister. They come、uh, to a press conference and to promote the art relief plan. The minister and ministry hopes to minimize the impact of the pandemic and to support the stable development of art ecology. In the meantime, arts and cultural institutions also implemented new ways of engagement, hoping to offer safe and interrupted arts activities to the public. So,、um, in the following, I would like to introduce the practice of CLAB. And before we go into this, I would like to play a very short video introducing CLAB.
infrastructure in recent years with the mission to support cultural experiment and innovation C-Lab has been geared to facilitate interdisciplinary collaboration and contemporary, among contemporary art, technological media, and social innovation since its inception in 2018. During this pandemic era, C-Lab upholds its mission as a lab for innovation and a hub for public engagement. We react to this unexpected crisis by rescheduling events first and then converting on-site activities into online presentations and encouraging artists to, or citizens to partake in pandemic prevention art actions. Furthermore, we have been keen to employ the digital and virtual solutions to overcome the current crisis. So in the following, I would like to introduce what we've been doing for in the C-Lab. The first will be the multiple channel presentation of online on-site exhibitions and performances. As a platform for artistic creation and presentation, C-Lab supports artists to propose site-specific projects and organize art festival every year during the pandemic. As the, public as the public gathering is not encouraged, many live events have been switched to online streaming format. In this April, we invite artist Yao Ruizhong to present recent new production in his solo show, The Republic of Scenics. This exhibition, as you see, um, can we go back to the uh, last one? Yes. This exhibition, uh, as you see, is uh, dealing with uh, the, the topics about art and poli politics, and also showing the artist's reflection on na national identity and national legitimacy. In addition to the real presentation, we launched a, a series of online talks and virtual guided tour led by exhibition curator, art celebrity, and, public, and popular YouTubers. This exhibition also featured an online 360 This is the, uh, the virtual tour we did for the audience. And in addition to this visual art exhibition, in this August, C-Lab opened its annual summer festival, Play Arts as Plant, and made use of both online and offline channels to showcase diverse events of performances, broadcasts, and workshops. As we, as we see, see on the screen, the Summer Festival Play Arts has been one of our feature activities in C-Lab. <laughs> And we would like to provide a time for the audience to see, uh, to enjoy the art uh, in their daily life. And we will see here is the, uh, we have been doing a kind of, a, a series of workshops. This is a workshop taking place online. And we invite um, instructors from Japan and Italy to teach the young uh, performer. The site of C-Lab was previously the Industrial Research Institute during the Japanese colonial period and the Air Force headquarters after the war. This May, after more than 50 years isolation from the public, the toll war encircling the site were taken down. C-Lab is now transforming to an open civil space and cultural park. With the pandemic gradually coming under control, we kept a close watch on the latest contemporary life for the right timing to open up the site. We commissioned artist A.G. Chen to produce a new live sculpture and performance to jumpstart art revitalization and public participation in the post-pandemic age. It became one of the large 
outdoor event in Taiwan to relaunch cultural activities. And this new event perf perfectly incorporates the live streaming pandemic information with historical context of the site. It successfully attract many citizens to enjoy the outdoor audiovisual festival in, sa in a safe environment. And um, so we will see a short documentary video uh, introducing this event. So in this event, we try to keep the capacity of participants to under 5,000 and all the audience have to be there and before they enter to entering into the site, they need to take their body temperature and doing and they need to do the hand sterilization and wearing facial mask. And the light sculpture itself is composed of several important elements, which are the pandemic information and the history of sea life and the contemporary life during the, this era. We also invite artists from uh, contemporary jazz players and also some a cappella singers to perform on the site. And in addition to the, these outdoors or indoors performances and exhibition, we also put up a live streaming space and online platform. Since this year, CLAP has been aware of the significance of online virtual platform as another regular base for cultural experiments. We have set up a live streaming studio to facilitate online creative ideas and practice. We also launched the Stream CLAP online platform project to provide the studio and the technical support to call for a proposal from all sectors. We hope this project will give rise to new ways of exhibitions and performances and create more opportunities for interaction. As an institution that supports innovation and new creation, we have been planning a bio-art exhibition this year to explore the collaboration among art, science, and technology. With the title of Fictional Life, Hybridity, Transgenetics, Innovation, this bio-art project featured the interplay, the interplay of biotechnology innovation and techno-art practice. As the pandemic has postponed the real exhibition to next year, alternatively, a new series of online virtual events using online technology and web platform have been successfully launched with the combination of online streaming performances, virtual forum, and online workshops. These activities also serve as a pilot research and a, and a warm up event for the coming exhibition next year. So in the following, I would like to introduce another project tailor-made for the pandemic prevention. That is what we call the art action of pandemic prevention and revitalization. And this is another project, COVID-19 Daily Art in Action Project. It incorporates digital humanities, social practice, and artistic creation, scientific research to formulate interdisciplinary art action. Many selective proposals ta tackle issues of public health, virus disperse, and pandemic prevention, reflecting an urgent concern from the public. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, people from underprivileged region have suffered from shortage of medicine supplies. Hence, CLAB invites practitioners with backgrounds in biomedicine, 
electronic engineering, techno art, and architecture to jointly advocate the maker spirit and organize workshops to support the pandemic prevention. Through knowledge sharing and hands-on practice, the workshop taught participants to make their own prevention devices, such as UV light boxes and infrared thermometers, allowing them to quickly set up prevention mechanism at home for themselves and their loved ones. So we also, in honor of the open culture and free sharing spirit, all the records related to the above workshops we share with the public by way of creative commons. All the material will publish through multiple international networks and social medias. So the video seen now, uh, seen here, is the, the video we put online. This is a free, um, it's a free DIY, DIY kit for public use. So how do we re how how does sea life reflect on this pandemic? Crisis is pandemic a crisis or opportunity. The global outbreak of COVID-19 has devastated the world for over nine months now. Not only is it a malicious challenge to human survival, it also reshuffled the value of existence. During this period, many discussions falls on the impact of abnormal reality caused by the pandemic. As C-Lab is a fairly new art institution, the outbreak of pandemic reminds us to reconsider our infrastructure building and further and future master planning. We regard the digital transformation as a way to enhance institutional capability and to create and, and creative production, public service. Since the beginning of this century, technological invention have been trying to break down, to break through the limitation of human body and proactively exploring the perception of the tangible self in the virtual digital world. This virtual world is constantly expanding between reality and fiction and producing new creative landscapes. During the pandemic age, the development of technological media has easily been made remote or repeated viewing possible. Given so many online digital programs are implemented, we have been thinking if the digital and online platforms become the major means, how will the new applications of media and, te and technical tools inspire new creation production? broaden the communication channels, or develop new interactive experiences. We are experience achieve a new breakthrough. When it comes to creative production, how would the value of art be redefined? The meaning of art be transformed or be altered? How would digital and online work respond to the common questions, such as the disappearance of artistic aura, the rupture of on-site context or the singularity of art be replaced by the commonality of representation. What creative format or innovative breakthrough would be achieved by this new being model? Will the ongoing digital transformation give rise to a new managing mechanism, operation system, or business models? So audience Development has always been the top priority for arts and cultural organization. The practice of learning, sharing, creating has become a common service for audience interaction. And it is highly acknowledged that audience are not passive recipients of information. Instead, they, are always refine, they always refine the meaning of art through new experience and method of participation. In this age, thought of changes we need to build a more organic and creative environment and foster sound operation of the system. When confronting with the new media relationship, how, how can we adopt and utilize new technology to develop innovative art experience 
and learning skills, how to trigger audience inner creativity and encourage their participation as well as collective creation. Moreover, for the elderly, underage, and disabled minority groups, how do we address the issue of digital divide, digital equity, and public access? In this post-pandemic age, lockdowns have been gradually lifted, and both online and offline activities have been launched. Many art institutions strive to, con strive to convert temp uh, strive to convert temporary lockdown uh, and limitation to highly creative and interactive sharing that trigger empathy and bring healing effect. As, a, as art has the power to bring emotional, intellectual, and creative values to our lives. During the COVID-19 pandemic period, C-Lab adopted the policy of prevention, relief, and revitalization we have attempted to circumvent the challenges and make efforts to engage the public by providing opportunities for artistic creation, learning, and social connection. As a platform to support cultural experiment and innovation, we believe that public participatory and critical roles of CLAP should be carried out through the public service at all times from individual to community, and eventually to the public domain. Thank you.
now we are we are not we are about to begin. However, sorry, let me check. 那个画面是往人类看到画面吗โอเค we are about to begin Hi morning again everyone this is River Ling and followed by the keynote speech over by Shanglin Lai the executive director of Taiwan Contemporary Culture Lab. In this uh, conference, in collaboration with uh, AA, AASN, now we are going to have a section of panel discussion. And in this panel discussion, I will be your moderator today. And today we have a very um, amazing <laughs> composition of panel members from museum and theater sectors. And let me introduce all of them to all of you around the world. So we have Emily Sexton, the artistic director from Art House Melbourne. Hi, Emily. <laughs> and we have Eriko Kimula, the curator of Yokohama Museum of Art and also the curatorial head of Yokohama Triennial. Hello, Eriko, Eriko Sam. Hi. 
Well, she will come back. <laughs> hello, hello, Erico. And we have um, Russell Storer, the director of curatorial and collection at National Gallery Singapore. Hello, Russell. And we have Ki Hong Lao, the head of theater performing arts at West Kao Long Cultural District in Hong Kong. Hi, everyone. everyone. Yeah, and today the, the title of the panel discussion is What Makes Museums and Theaters Social Again? Assembly Something in a Post COVID 19 Era. And like everybody, like all of us, like as an individual, um, cultural and arts worker, practitioner, artist, producer, and even for people who lo uh, work in the arts institutions. All of us have been through the um, strong effect of the COVID-19 over the past few months. And, and I think during, over the past few months that during this period of time, it was very crucial and critical that we are confronting ourselves how to respond to you know socially politically to the current situation as well as observing how our colleagues are um, surviving or trying to do something like positively uh, particularly to support the arts community or to get connected again through the digital platforms or online tools to have um, deeper conversation or in dialogue in this um, very special moment and today, um, I have felt that very interestingly, um, it, is, it would be very interesting that people, I mean, cultural leaders from the other institutions, particularly close boundaries and disciplines can come together sharing uh, each of our different experiences as well as the methodology or even philosophy towards the medium of art and also the liveness of bodies and also the solidarity of um, so-called Asian connection together. And so at the very beginning, I would like to invite uh, each of our panel members to share uh, what's your situation, what's your cases, and what have you been through. And so the first uh, presenter will be Eriko Sang, please. Okay, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, good morning. Yes, Eric Hosan, we can hear you. Can I hear, hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, can you please share my pictures? Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this forum, um, and I'm very much looking forward to hear everyone. And uh, part of my presentation, a description about is everyone thinks to the. Uh, Yes, yes, the C lab, C -Lab has, has the slides, the slides. so I you cannot see a model. Okay, any revision? Well, the Yokohama Museum of Art, which is a modern and contemporary art museum, opened in 1989. And the Yokohama, uh, Tokyo, uh, the metropolitan city of Japan, and it supports it's, uh, the closest seaport for international trading since uh, 19th century, uh, which is neighboring to Tokyo. Oops. Oh, 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 left. Oh, 
Okay, let's maybe wait a little bit. This is the realities of our world now, where <laughs> technology will always fail us. Connections will be disrupted. I know. So, <laughs> like, right, can you hear me? Instead, instead, how are you? you? <laughs> This, this embodiment <laughs> is so particular. I know. It's so easy. <laughs> yeah. It does justify, um, it coming, does justify together, uh, coming together face to face. Yeah. 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 The specialness of that. The specialness of that. Absolutely. Right. So, uh, right. so oh, okay. Uh, Eddie Tosa. Oh, okay. okay. Eddie Tosa. Tony Juan, you you're back. Oh my god. Eriko oh san. Um you were you were you you are muted. You need to turn on your microphone. Yes. My 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 microphone. Yes, yes, now it's now fine. fine. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, now it's strange that I cannot see, see the, the, the slides. Now the slide. Yes. Now the our staff member is presenting your um, slide. Okay. Okay. I cannot see I cannot the slides, see the slides, but slides anyway, but anyway, I would keep on talking. So slide. Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 So when you are, uh, the image of yeah, five facilities of our museum. museum. And we, uh, usually we have 800,000 million visitors per year. And not only do they participate, participate in workshops, shop programs, or to But this year, since early in February, February uh, um, we, we have, we ha uh, uh, no, no, actually, we closed early February and um, solo, one solo exhibition here called Sing that uh, sat closed. And, and since last uh, late January, few participants of COVID-19 increased. Increase increased and, and through the last few months of February, the number, number was uh, <laughs> I think the Wi-Fi connection is right. quite weak, so mm -hmm. yeah. Um, um, let me text let me her, her to, to use to change, to change another <laughs> Wi-Fi <laughs> Demand. Yeah. Um, um, so, so, how about, about Pi Hong? Sure. Yes. 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 Could you <laughs> take over? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me text her at the same time. Sure, sure. Hi, everyone. Good morning. 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 Um, um, you know, you just, know to, just to, you know, you kind, know of kind of briefly respond uh, uh, to your to publication. Your publication. Uh, uh, um, obviously, obviously in Hong Kong, Kong, you know, um, you know, you know we, we also have to see, you know, where we are right now in the context of what has been happening with us last year. So COVID-19, of course, um, you know, started in the beginning of the year for us here in Hong Kong. Uh, but this came on the back of, um, 
you know, almost half a year of demonstrations from September on the street. So, so, so in, in that situation, you know, we have been in sort of crisis management uh, since then. Um, and of course, and of the course COVID-19, COVID um, um, uh, you know, you know impact, impact has, has really, really also, also you know, forced, you know, forced us into, into um, really, really rethinking, rethinking you know, you know, what, what is at all possible. possible. Um, um, maybe, maybe we don't share, share the slides quite, slides quite yet. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I, you know, you know what, what I wanted to say, say is that, that obviously, obviously, you know, like, like for us, us uh, under, under COVID-19, COVID we have been closed um, for, pretty for pretty much of the year, in, year 20, in 2020, so since January, since January uh, we have uh, mostly, mostly been closed down the exit, uh, and, uh, and we already, already have two theatres up and running, which is really City Centre and City Space, and of course the Art Park. Um, but because, because under COVID-19 COVID regulations, we have had to remain closed, closed. and we, we had a small window in July where we, we opened open for two weeks, and then we had to, we had to, we had to close again. again. Uh, but now, uh, but now uh, uh, we have uh, reopened, we have reopened our theatres at the rest of the space, space in Hong Kong, Kong since, since the 1st of October, October. And, already and already we're hearing that the fourth wave is kind of lurking around the corner. So we're trying to assess how best to keep going as much as possible. But what I, I really want to say is that under this kind of situation, especially uh, without, uh, without cinema performing, performing arts, where we give a live performance, um, of, course of course the question of physical assembly becomes uh, very, very much a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so of course many of, many of us, like um, my colleagues around, around, around the world and elsewhere, um, have also, also been doing a lot of unproducing, yeah. Yeah. dealing with postponement <laughs> cancellations. <laughs> All of that, you know, and, and especially when, when, like myself, I belong to a large institution, you know, there's sometimes it's, it's kind of a, a super stressful uh, situation. Um, but I, I take a lot of comfort in many ways um, on the ability to, or at least we're asked to slow down. You know, not just us um, as curators with the institutions, but also together with artists in the city. You know, we have been given uh, the moment to slow down. And this is, this is asymptomatic of, I think, how we operate anyway. Um, so this slowing down has also give us, given us the time and space to really reimagine and rethink, you know, what would live performance look like in the future? And, and so my, my mind and my practice um, has quickly led me into thinking around speculative future. Yeah. So rather than um, trying to uh, address, oh, what would, how can we go back to some version of normality, you know, when we reopen again, you know, when people can travel again. So all of that is not going to go away anytime soon. And, and so it is required really us to, to be quite sharp in, in, in really trying to imagine, you know, given this context, you know, what would it look like? Yeah. So, so of course, in the initial days um, when everybody had to be in lockdown, I was literally working from home for I think in total, probably I would say about five months, which is kind of ridiculous. Uh, and I'm sure, like Emily in Melbourne, can attest to the to the impact on your own mental health. Uh, you know, having been cooped up in your own room day in, day out. And so one of the things we wanted to kind of deal with is this precisely this, this kind of emotional and psychological uh, um, kind of context yeah, about everybody's mental health. And like you say, you know, how do we address and manifest and articulate some sense of solidarity? Mm -hmm. and, and so, and now you can show the slides. And, and so we... We embarked so on, on, I think, a, a, a project that was also um, born out of, I think, artists reflecting on, on what has been going on with them uh, and the impact to their work. And, and, and so, you know, when our theatres were closed, when under our regulations we are not allowed to receive live audiences, uh, we could manage uh, to at least still use our spaces for the private activities so stuff that we can work with artists uh, without a live audience and and so one of i just wanted to just highlight one project and one of these projects um 
was uh, imagined uh, together with uh, Hong Kong director uh, Edward Lam. Um, and he's someone that we've been working with uh, in the last uh, three, four years, um, essentially to kind of rethink a, a lot about, um, you know, the, the, the space of theatre um, and, and around thinking um, how do we uh, remake live performance and so one of the proposals is to uh, invite uh, other actors in the city who, of course, um, like everybody else, have uh, lost work, have you know stopped performing. And so we wanted to, to gather um, like 30 actors uh, to come inside this theatre, this empty theatre, to kind of reflect where they are right now um, and, and what does live performance in theatre mean for them. And, and so what, what resulted is a series of uh, very short um, films by each of the actors uh, encountering and, and literally facing an empty auditorium. Yeah? And, and of course, the, the lens was all shot from the, their, their back. That means you, you look at the back, but not the, the faces which usually actors are kind of used to. So, so, so essentially, the audiences uh, online uh, viewing the films uh, we invited um, really to also encounter uh, this particular moment. You can go on to the next slide. Next one. Next one. So, so with these um, 30 actors, um, they are also actors that at work, um, well, about 95% of them he has never worked with. So it also allowed some way of bu building a rebuilding community, if you will, so these, these performers come from very backgrounds, from film to TV to stage, um, you know, uh, and to contemporary performance. And, and essentially, you know, it's also to, to, to give them a, a moment that we can be together again, um, even in this uh, uh, strange times. And so when, when we release these uh, series of films at the beginning of August, um, you know, it, it also spoke uh, to, to many people uh, 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 around the world because they, they also articulated a lot of what we were feeling right now. And actually, um, sometime in August, we were planning to do some version of an open house to slowly receive audiences back again to get people's bodies reused to, you know, uh, being with each other. And of course, we had to shut down. So, so that program went out the window, yeah. Um, and, and, and maybe I, I, I wouldn't go and play the film because I, I want to give other people more time. And, and you can go online if you search uh, empty theatre, free space. Uh, you will find um, uh, our YouTube channel and, and then you, you can view the, the films on your own. But I, I, I want to quickly go on essentially um, about this context of speculating futures. Yeah? Because I think, it's, and, and this we've talked about quite a bit, of the limitations of the digital. You know, obviously, we're so not satisfied, especially with live performance, about the lack of audience agency, the lack of, I think, tactility. I, I think you know, there is no kind of bodily connection even between uh, performers and audience and also between audiences. Mm -hmm. and, and so this has led me to, to really start to explore and investigate, you know, if, what if, what if in the futures, you know, we, we think about um, live performance as operating within expanded virtualities. And when I say expanded virtualities, I mean not just the digital, but also return to some version of the analog um, and also exploring and accessing um, practice that, you know, usually we, we, we tend not to associate with. For example, like dream work, like dreaming. Um, where, where essentially you're also um, rethinking about uh, spaces and realms that exist in other types of cosmologies and other knowledge systems. And of course, this um, has already existed in, say, for example, the thinking and practice and being of First Nations peoples. So, so in that sense, uh, 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 a lot of my uh, kind of trajectories have been about this kind of work. Um, and, and so uh, right now we're in this preparation of working with different types of artists across from Hong Kong and elsewhere um, in, in thinking uh, through these different directions. And then next year, 
we will attempt and begin to prototype some of these um, uh, uh, versions of live performance that uh, one of uh, two or three principles that we want to operate from is one is that uh, in what if in the future despite apart from regardless of what happens live performance and assembling can go on even though if we have to shut our theaters mm -hmm. and second is that you know what does age audiences agencies look like in this kind of context mm -hmm. and third is that question of assembly what does assembly then look like in this kind of context mm -hmm. so i i don't have uh, a lot of the answers um but i i you know from what i i kind of feel and gather and in the multiple conversations i've been having um, many of us are, are kind of operating simultaneously, you know, uh, simultaneously in, in this kind of various directions. And I feel that the, the, the zeitgeist is kind of leading us to some kind, um, you know, of, of an explosion that is super exciting for me. So, so I, I think maybe I, I, I will stop here for now because I think there are other points we can talk about in the discussion later. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. 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 Yeah. yeah, we don't need to play the video. Uh, uh, <laughs> we don't, we don't <laughs> need to play the video. Play the video. Right. Yeah. Um, um, for um, for um, all our online, online viewers, if you are interested in, in watching, watching this project, this project in collaboration with Edward Lam, you can, you can YouTube, YouTube. You can find, you can find those, those works on YouTube. On YouTube. And, the and the keyword is waste column amphitheater, and you'll, and you'll find its website and all the video works online. Um, yeah, um, yeah, thank, thank you, Kihong, Hong, for um, addressing and actually uh, um, raising some, some crucial points um, about the assembly and the future of the audience, audience, audience agency, agency and also, and also art, art making. Um, um, shall, we shall we come back to Erico? Sorry for captivating, and I think this time it will be fine. Yes, yes you, uh, you look better. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Your image you look better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so Erica, uh, would you like to share to us about your experience yeah. of operating yes, the, yeah, the Kohama Triennial? The triennial. Yes, mm. yes, yes. And can you also share my uh, slides from yes, the yes, fourth share, one? Share, share the slides, please. Yeah, I will start from the, I, I won't repeat the beginning. <laughs> I will start from the Yokohama Triennial. So our museum closed in February and from March, we had a big discussion and I'll, you can change the slide to the next one and next one, next one, thank you. And uh, our organization is a little bit different from the museum and we have the separate organization for the Yokohama Triennial uh, because uh, it has a, a little bit complicated history so uh, shall I share I'll share some uh, old images from the beginning can you change the slides uh, I will look through them quickly uh, the Yokohama Triennial was started in 2001 and this is one of the oldest international exhibition continued uh, since uh, 2001. And first to third edition, can you go through the slides? Please change the slides. Yeah. And until the first one, until 2008, the third edition were mainly organized by the Japan Foundation as national project and co-organized by the city of Yokohama. And venues have been various and changed every time around the Bay Area of Yokohama. And can you change the slides? Yeah. And this is a current image, but you can change the slides. Um, this is the current one, and this is the current one as well. And the next slides, please. And this one is the first one it happened in 2001, and this is 2005. You can change and change these. We did at the warehouse, and this is third one. And we also use a different warehouse and also use outside venues in, inside the city. And please change the slides. And you can go next one and stop. 
And since 2011, the Yokohama Museum of Art became the main venue of Yokohama Triennial, and the museum finally joined the organization, organizers of Yokohama Triennial. And it became kind of a museum-based exhibition, which is a bit similar to Taipei Biennial or Singapore Biennial. And since then, uh, museum curator also joined to the curatorial team of Yokohama Triennial, and we took um, a major role inside the organizers. Um, so, which means that we cannot decide everything within the museum. We have to, every time, uh, make a big discussion within the larger team out of the museum. So, please change the slide. And this is from 2011 and change the slide. This is inside view of Yokohama Triangle, uh, the, the museum. And please change the slides. And this is the fixed edition. And please change the slide. And please change the slides again. I think this is something uh, very familiar within the Taiwanese people. Uh, this truck is made in Taiwan and shipped to Yokohama. And this is a moving stage for uh, contemporary artist Yanagi Miwa, who made the theatrical projects. And it's still uh, moving around uh, Japan. And please change the slides. And, change. and this is the la late uh, last edition in 2017. I Weiwei made a big installation. And please change the slides. And switch it. Yeah, this is uh, also from the last one. And change the slides, please. And we always make some kind of a large scale installation with the artist's own site as a specific uh, site specific project. And as well as this time, we are planning to have those kind of site specific artworks with the international artists gather on site and they make the uh, artworks uh, mostly spending more than a month on site in Yokohama. And we, uh, we had more than 60 artists to be participate for this uh, latest version for 2020. But this time, uh, most of them couldn't come. So we had a big discussion in late, late, uh, late in March that uh, shall we keep this project or shall we uh, make something, uh, something different? Then we decided to keep on preparing this project at the end of March as planned, because uh, we thought at that time, we thought uh, the situation will get better uh, by summer. So, uh, and we also asked many of our collaborators to the logistic company or the fabricators whether they can make uh, to ship the work from uh, outside of Japan or whether they can fabricate the walls, temporary walls or make some installation inside the space. And they said the logistics are moving and fabrication is fine. And only the, uh, only the people cannot travel. So we decide to keep on doing this project. And please change the slides. So since then, uh, in April, we contacted all the artists to discuss how we can realize every project under restricted situation of COVID-19. And please change the slides. And only few of the artists changed their plans, uh, which they couldn't make some trouble to shoot their video, new video work, or uh, sometimes they couldn't get the appropriate materials, then they have to change the material. Or some of the artists who want to make the workshop-based uh, artwork in Yokohama had to change uh, their ideas. But most of, uh, I think more than 80% of the artists could realize their uh, artworks as they planned uh, with the remote uh, installing. And for example, this artist, this is Eva Fabregas, the uh, Spanish origin artist who lives in London. And she made this huge uh, soft sculptures on site in Yokohama, but 
without her presentation. So uh, we uh, asked our local artists to collaborate with her and uh, they made up the big installation. And please change the slides. Um, this is Zuza Golinska. She's a Polish artist. And we also uh, managed to do the installation and made up her work remotely. And these kind of works uh, we could manage, but some certain type of C artworks were really hard to uh, create. Please change the slide. One of the artists was Taiwanese artist, Jiang Xu uh, I think uh, he's very uh, popular in Taiwan. And he made up a really huge installation uh, with uh, tiny, tiny puppets and the diorama made by newspaper, old newspapers. And usually he made up a really huge installation using this, uh, covering all the space inside the gallery. And this time we plan to make a huge installation inside the kitchen of the museum, uh, former restaurant kitchen. And, but, uh, Artists, I think John wants to come to Japan at the very last minutes, until the very last minutes, but finally uh, we had to give up uh, to him to come here. So we, uh, we hired a Chinese translator and uh, we installed all through online using the small uh, iPhones and showing each pieces, which pieces to go where and where. I think it won't took that long. Uh, we took more than a week to build up all the installation. But if he could come on site, we can, I think we can manage uh, in probably half, half of the uh, duration of the old installment process. So some of, some, uh, especially uh, the sculpture is very difficult but uh, of course we could uh, invite some of the artists who lives inside Japan please change the slides there were uh, more than 10 artists uh, who lives in Japan and not only Japanese but also some of the uh, foreign oriented uh, artists and they came on site and they made up really nice installations so I really uh, managed to uh, uh, learn that uh, some type of the artworks can be installed remotely but some type of the artworks are really hard to do it uh, online or uh, without the artist presentation um, it cannot be realized and but I think uh, we mostly successfully done about the exhibition and we had a uh, good number of visitors uh, more than uh, 145,000 visitors uh, during three months exhibition and we haven't counted yet for the precise numbers but many many online visitors had also visited our triennale because we also had a huge numbers of the online projects please change the slides and please change the slides again and since the very beginning uh, we had a uh, online projects like the press conference, which was happened uh, one day before the public open, and the press conference happened physically and online both. And we limit the number of the uh, attendance from the press people to come on site to see the exhibition. But many of the press people can join online press conference as well as the Rox Media Collective uh, remotely uh, attended uh, from India. And, and please change the slides. And please change the slides. And we also had a serial event series which called Episodo. 
episodo is the Japanese pronunciation for episodes, and they, uh, the Rux Media Collective like the pronunciation of Japanese people says episodo, and so we changed a little, uh, a little bit, slightly different uh, with the O, it's a uh, longer O, and this episodo started uh, before the exhibition. And also after the exhibition, and not only Yokohama, but also in Johannesburg. And one happened in Hong Kong recently, and also online. And some uh, version happened in Japan, in Yokohama uh, as well. And many of the artists try to manage what can be, what has to be on site, and what can be. Uh, much better uh, performative online. So I'm showing the two examples. One is this Iwai Masaru, the Japanese artist project. Uh, he made a workshop-based uh, artwork. Uh, and first, he had two months this uh, serial discussion within the online uh, participants and keep them discussing about what is the cleanliness or what is the exclusivity of the uh, feeling of the cleanliness and also what is cleaning somewhere. And because he had been uh, attending uh, to clean the Fukushima nuclear power plant since 2011 as part of his artistic activity. So he had a very uh, thoughtful uh, mind about what is the cleanliness or what is cleaning, the act of cleaning. And so he wants to share his idea within the ordinary people, how we can uh, manage our idea among, uh, around cleaning something. And so after long discussion, uh, he made up his own mask uh, made with the paper uh, bag, paper bag, and he also sent out the paper bag to the participants of the discussions, and those participants also made their own masks, and then they made a performance outside uh, on the street to clean, and he, the artist also came on site to to the museum and he cleaned up the museum during the exhibition period is happening. And he also uh, streamed online. So he uh, wanted to spread all his activities to the on street and on site, both to the close people and both to the uh, open public. And the second slide, please change the slide. This is the last slide. And this is another Japanese artist project. Uh, the artist's name is Tamura Yuichiro. He's basically a visual artist who makes the video work or video installation. But this time he made a performance uh, both online and on site. He made up a chroma key studio setting inside the theater setting of the museum. And he invited the people to see uh, his theatrical performance with the professional performer. But uh, the people who came into the theater can see only the blue back and the QR code. And then they have to open their laptop or uh, smartphones and see the online performance uh, through that, uh, accessing to the QR code website. And then they will see the middle image or the right image of the combined image of the chroma key effect. So uh, he wanted to show both the kind of the imperfectness of the both online or uh, physical uh, situation. I think uh, this kind of the artistic uh, activity between on-site and online uh, can be something work for near future under new normal situation. Um, okay, so I think I will finish my presentation now and I want to hear the other people's thoughts later. Thank you, Thank you Eric. Eric. Yes, yes, we, we, we will, will be, able be able to explore more uh, about, about our current, current um, practices practice of hosting, hosting events online and on site mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. Um, so the next one will be Ra Russell. Russell. 
also you will need to turn on your microphone. I'm sorry, I know everybody is not familiar with Google Meet. <laughs> Also, you will need to move the mouse onto our green window, and then you will see an icon of microphone, and then you turn on it. Ah, okay. Emily. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay. Um, hello, I'm Emily Sexton. I'm Artistic Director at Arts House in Melbourne. Um, I'm talking to you for the, from the land of the Boonarang and the Wurundjeri people, and I'd like to pay my respect to their elders, both past, present and emerging. Um, so our uh, Arts House building has been closed since March 2020. And yeah, Ki Hong, we've been, I've been working from home for eight months, and saying that out loud makes me want to uh, scream inside my heart, as the Japanese would say. Um, I haven't seen any theatre this year. I've watched a lot of K-drama, and that's not so bad, because uh, K-drama is amazing, but, um, <laughs> but I, miss, I miss real people. <laughs> um, um, but Hyunbin will do it for me for a little while. Anyway, um, we had two major programs already underway at Arts House um, that addressed the conditions that we're um, operating under. So. The first one was Bleed. It was conceived uh, pre-pandemic and it explored what does online feel like. This is a major partnership with Campbelltown Arts Centre in Western Sydney. Um, and a, in a little bit, I'll show a sort of video highlights of, of that festival. Uh, we, the second program that we had, um, uh, we're already working on for the last five years, is called Refuge and it explores art, crisis and emergency. And in 2018, um, we actually explored pandemics and what, would, uh, what we would be doing if we weren't coming together. Now, there's a lot of reasons why I am in great admiration of Taiwan and the way that um, Taiwan has managed the pandemic. And I'm particularly inspired to hear the sort of uh, prevention work that Sea Lab is doing, just even though Taiwan has managed the pandemic so well. Um, so Refuge is part of Arts House's program. It's quite unusual. It takes advantage of um, our, our, I guess, context because we are part of city government. And so we, um, we're part of the city of Melbourne. And so we leverage that opportunity to connect artists with emergency management, uh, with the Red Cross, uh, with climate scientists who work within the city of Melbourne. And what's been remarkable this year as we've conducted um, the Refuge Lab Online is to note the resilience of the, the key ensemble of, of those refuge artists because they've been working to think about crisis for five years. They have a language and a, an, an ability to adapt that um, and, and I guess an inner cheerfulness that um, many of the other artists that I work with just haven't been able to understandably been able to muster. So. Um, Refuge has been a very meaningful project and I can tell, talk more about what we'll be doing next year with that work. And then the last kind of key adaptation um, is that we did a call out for um, uh, housewarming commissions for when we reopen. Um, similar to Yuki Hong, um, we called for works to um, constitute a party and now that just feels hilarious because when we do reopen it won't be with a big the kind of party that I would love to be at right now, it will, and so we've, re, we've had to adapt um, what those works and installations will become. Um, since Bleed closed, it was a 10-week festival at the end of August, um, we've been conceiving and consulting on a new program for the next two years, um, and this will explore artists to um, think about ideas of place in a changed city. There won't be outcomes, but they'll be put, supported with um, a significant fee for 12 months to collaborate with each other and think about context because um, and, and what it means when public space is charged and, and has to be navigated in so many different ways. When our ideas of, of, of gathering and, and coming together have been completely transformed. So that, that I don't really know where that program will go because it will be artist-led, but um, 
but we're very interested in using, um, for example, the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals as, I guess, a key benchmark to, to inform the themes that the artists will be exploring. And also to, again, use that context that I was describing to, to re really put artists at the table in the conversations about what cities are to become because, uh, yeah, the City of Melbourne is doing a hell of a lot of work in that space but at the moment, but I don't see artists being involved um, in a significant way in those discussions. And they have so much to offer because they are people who um, are very used to operating with uncertainty um, and to being in an, an uncertain um, state of mind for an extended period. So um, that program we will announce in the coming, in the, um, coming weeks. When we think about 2021, and it is, um, uh, what's the word, um, well, it's um, sobering to hear you talk about fourth waves, um, but we are imagining um, if we can reopen after um, this second wave that we've experienced is done, that, they'll, that we will be programming things that are gentle and slow. Um, and very much about our local neighbourhood. It'll be about reintroducing the idea that it is um, possible to see visible signs of art as part of your local community. So we'll, we'll continue to work internationally and nationally um, in terms of our programming. I think our, our audiences and the communities we interested, will be interested in will, will be very, very local um, in, for the foreseeable future. Um, just to talk a little bit more about Bleed, because it was a major program, um, we might go to the short video that I sent, um, yes. if that's okay. Short video, please. One, yes? Yes. Cool. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I guess my our main learnings or observations um, about the Bleed program was that of an audience of 12,000, we had about 75% local. And I think it's true that um, the internet is not placeless um, and most audiences remain connected to the institutions or to the artists that they already know. Um, and I think we should perhaps we could come back to that point a bit later. Um, for us, daytime programming um, was a lot more successful online than it would be if we were to be doing it in our venue. Um, so that's an interesting um, learning for us going forward. I think um, while it was a really long time to be in delivery mode for our, um, you know, to be doing a festival for 10 weeks felt long, um, but actually that distributed programming worked well for us, that, that longer duration, because the idea of critical mass and kind of doing a lot of things um, just really um, didn't sit um, well with the very busy kinds of brains that we've all got mm. in 2020. So um, we're also applying that lesson and thinking to our future program. We've always worked to that kind of 
critical mass of festivals and um, we're thinking about longer forms, more like three-month exhibitions or biennales where um, that consistent programming creates a presence in people's lives um, in an ongoing way. Mm. Um, we learnt a lot about what we really mean by live online um, mm. because uh, live means, as, you know, as we know, it, it can mean misconnections and um, dodgy internet. At, um, really um, compromising, I guess, the artistic production levels. So um, we thought a lot more about live as being a sort of noted presence of others, a co-presence, um, live meaning a layering of experiences so that there was a chat as well as, um, yeah, as well as the talking, as well as watching. So, and um, some degree of agency in how, in how you were viewing things was, was felt like liveness. Um, it didn't mean that the performing was performing. The performer was performing somewhere right now, you know. Um, and I think one of the, the successful works really worked with the dramaturgy of the platform. So they took what it could do and, and kind of took that to its um, most interesting conceptual level. Um, so yeah, those. And I guess the final point I would make too is that, in general, um, I have observed that the, of the, all of the artists that we working that we are working with, the ones who are thinking in a research-driven way and have a core concept and then have multiple outputs um, or modular kind of approaches to how their work is executed. Um, they have fared um, with greater resilience th and um, through all of these changes that we're experiencing and will continue to change. So, um, yeah, so those kinds of projects are, are sort of uh, the ones that we're trying to hold very carefully because um, I feel very uncomfortable as a curator being the one to kind of you know, drag a, a work from from its for, former form into a new one. Um, if it's the artist being interested in that, then that's fine. But um, uh, there's there's many many works that for us were you know were very close to pre-production or were in pre-production, and we need to wait until we can actually honour their intention and that craft. So, um, yeah, that's probably the key observations that I'd share. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, we will be, I hope at the, um, during our discussion, we will be able to touch a few of points, like including the digitalization and the alternative, perhaps also new art form of art making in this digital and virtual sphere in terms of the co-presence of everything. Yeah. And, okay, Basso. Yes, hi, I'm back. Sorry, I had some settings issues. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't used this platform before. Um, can we share the slides? Yes, share the slide, please. Yeah, so hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm from the National Gallery of Singapore, which is a fairly new museum. It only opened five years ago in 2015. Um, but we're you know, the largest art museum in, in the country and in the region. Um, and we oversee a collection of around 8,000 uh, works um, of Southeast Asian art. So we really have a very regional focus um, and particularly modern. So we're a partner museum with the Sing Singapore Art Museum, which focuses really on contemporary art, sort of 21st century. And we really look at the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, so just go to the next slide. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so COVID in Singapore, I mean, we closed in April and um, we were closed, the museum was closed for about two months. I mean, Singapore was fairly well managed, I guess, um, except for the, you know, the uh, migrant workers in the dorms. That was a very serious situation. Um, but outside of that, it was um, managed very quickly and the cases have been quite low. Um, and the systems were put in place very quickly. I mean, we learned from SARS, I think, like Hong Kong. Um, and, you know, we're sort of, we're still in a sort of restricted kind of situation in terms of gathering and so on, but otherwise things are almost seem a little bit back to normal. Um, but of course, in terms of the museum, um, we don't have any tourists, which was a large, around half of our visitorship. Um, so we've really had to recalibrate to the local much more, which I'll talk about in a bit. And I guess, as Ki Hong said, this idea to slow down and to reflect has been very important. And initially, we were kind of thrilled that this was the chance to sort of pause, but of course, that didn't last very long. <laughs> and, um, you know, it just meant a whole lot of other stuff to be done. Um, but, I mean, a lot of exciting stuff. 
And I mean, these are just some of the key questions that arose. So quite ex existential questions, particularly for a new museum. I mean, we've only really just got up and running. Um, but it, it's an opportunity to think back over what we've done over the past five years. What is our role as an art museum? I mean, a big part of our role is to introduce our audiences to the modern art of the region in particular. And it was the first time there's been long-term collection displays looking at the art history of, of Southeast Asia and Singapore. So that was a big part of our role, is really art historical. Um, but I guess what this has really pushed forward, and as is the case for museums around the world, you know, this, this sense of what is the social role of the museum. I mean, this had been building for some time, of course, but this has really pushed it to the forefront, is how can we be active participants in the civic commons? You know, and what can we really do for our local audiences um, in a very active way? You know, what's important to people? What do they need? You know, what can art and art museums do? So it's meant a reflection on who, who our audiences are, um, both physically and, and digitally, I guess. And, you know, how, of course, the logistical side of how we work, I think, is everyone understands that, you know, not being able to travel. And, um, so we did have to cancel two major international exhibitions this year. Um, and, of course, through all that, how do you support your staff, you know, who are working from home, um, who are perhaps isolated? Um, how do you manage work-life balance when they're not leaving their house? <laughs> um, they can, you know, so these are also big challenges which I think everyone is, is dealing with in different ways. But there was also what, what we can learn and, and keep you know, from this situation. You know, um, what are some of the learnings and some of the new ways of working that we can hold on to? Um, and what are the, some of the things that we can leave behind? So I guess maybe we can talk about this more um, in the conversation. So if you just go to the next slide. Um, so I guess the first aspect that we had to really think very quickly about was the digital. Um, you know, how do we translate what we do into a digital platform? And initially there was a sense that this could be translated fairly fast, but it, it, of course that's not really the case. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's a lot of capacity building to be done and obviously producing content. I mean, there's a lot of existing content that had to be refitted, but then how do you produce new content that's at the quality of your physical projects? Um, and so that's meant a lot of um, kind of reshaping you know, how, how we work and rethinking of what are the kind of platforms in a very, very busy, busy digital space. So initially we had this, what we call Gallery Anywhere, which we used as a kind of a holding portal for all our digital content, whether it be, you know, um, online programming, you know, recordings of talks and tours, uh, children's activities, um, 360 kind of exhibition kind of views and so on. Um, I'll just go to the next slide. And that's been kind of refined over the last few months into something more structured, um, you know, under different kind of categories and you know, really building our collection online as well. So access has been a really important element to that and how to make that really present. Of course, that requires a lot of investment. And I mean, the Singapore government has put quite a lot of funding, additional funding into, you know, enhancing the digital um, capacities and offering positions. I mean, it's also about employment as well. Um, but that's been very helpful in terms of getting a number of initiatives off the ground. Um, but I'll talk um, just now more about a project that we initiated um, in lieu of the exhibitions that we cancelled. If we just go to the next slide, which was something that we thought about in uh, with our partner museum, Singapore Art Museum, about, you know, how can we really develop some programming that also supports our local art community who obviously lost, you know, opportunities, um, income, um, you know, feeling disconnected. Um, so we reached out to all the arts organizations in the city that we could think of and invited them to be a part of this. And we called it Proposals for Novel Ways of Being, sort of playing off the novel coronavirus, um, but also, of course, this idea of new ways of living and thinking. And um, so we got a yeah, pretty good um, response. So this was in around May. You know, we started sort of devising this structure and we, um, we wanted to keep it very open, but also have a few basic principles. So to invite independent curators who are also you know, needing support. Um, we could each invite you know, up to around 10 artists 
a local artist to participate and there was a fee structure also. So some projects, like the National Museum project, is entirely online, um, whereas we produced a, a physical exhibition, so I was going to show some pictures of that. Um, and Singapore Art Museum also, which is currently under renovation, so they worked with one of our spaces as well. So we've got two complementary physical exhibitions um, side by side, each with around 10 artists, and inviting young um, independent curators to produce uh, a project. So I think River Centre provocation about or think you know think about slow curating but this was lightning speed curating <laughs> this was pulled together in about three months uh, which is unprecedented but everyone kind of really came to the party and um, you know the curators came up with really thoughtful um, ideas um, as a reflection on you know what we're going through what artists are thinking right now and it is really a very young generation you know artists born in the 90s and you know, um, and, and so on. So who've never shown in the gallery before, who've maybe felt very distant from the institution. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's really opened us up in a sense to, to them and, and them to us to really have an engagement and um, to think about um, what, you know, what are the sort of issues that artists are facing today? And um, yeah, so there's no, no pictures. I can, uh, I had for nice your pictures. information, your slide is still on, oh, on the, another channel of YouTube, so oh, online oh, viewers okay. can see that. Right, and now right, right. people see, people are seeing the image of an exercise of meaning in, okay, a, in a glitch season. season. Okay, great. Okay, so that that um, was the gallery's exhibition. So we invited a young curator, Shahida Iskandar, to to put together an exhibition. And oh, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, we just go to the next slide. So her title is very descriptive. I mean, this idea of how do you find meaning in this moment of the glitch? And as we've seen today, there's many glitches. Um, so how how does yeah what what can we find in in these disruptions and what some of the new things that can emerge out of that? Um, and I mean, the first two images are of artists who are sort of thinking about the spiritual, I guess. Um, there's a um, Katrina Razak has a work which is a kind of circular, circular work which is based on batik. So you move in and through the work. Um, so it's uh, got text on it as well. So it's this loss of space. Um, oh, thank you. Um, you know, when the spaces of worship, sites of worship were closed down. So there's thinking of what are the new spaces that we can develop. And then Kane um, on the other side is thinking of more of a digital altar. So it's quite a psychedelic, neo-psychedelic kind of work in a way, which sort of mashes together a number of different kind of um, riffs on spirituality, um, which sort of reflects the very multi-faith um, aspect of Singapore. Mm -hmm. Just go to the next slide. Um, and artists are also thinking about consumerism, consumption, um, you know, new technologies and their obsolescence. Um, 
So the work on the left by Clara Lim was sort of looking at um, National, which is that old Japanese white goods brand, but her mother used to have a National's microwaves. And um, it became sort of bought out by Panasonic in the early 2000s. So she sort of mashed together a number of old commercials, which are very much about consumption. And, but even these these goods have, have an obsolescence. Maybe these companies have an obsolescence. And there's a, a kind of LED reflecting the stock exchange moment when that company disappeared. So it's quite a, a playful work. Aki Hassan created a series of sculptures that were then translated into digital form as well. So there's a video screen accompanying each work, which sort of shows the mis mistranslation um, into the digital, sort of in a very physical kind of way. And then Sufyan's work was really pulling apart the infrastructure of the gallery space, you know, sort of, um, of the walls. Because I guess the other thing is we use all the existing walls in the gallery from our previous exhibition. So rather than sort of spending, you know, big on, on a new infrastructure, we, we wanted to just use what was already there rather than producing more in a sense. And then the next image on the left is a new commission. So I guess another of the big questions that's emerged in this time is, is about representation, about equality. And um, you know, Black Lives Matter um, has had a huge impact on museums around the world. And artists here are also responding to that, those questions as well. So Nora Leah is a, um, a, an artist who works with performance. And she um, developed a kind of riff off the painting in the background, which is in our collection called uh, National Language Class. It's a work from the 50s showing Chinese students learning to speak Malay. Um, and she worked with a number of um, performers who are a Malay, and Indian, um, uh, and non-binary um, as well. And, and they're sort of performing and sort of referencing a, a text by Raffles about um, the, the Malay, um, which is quite a disparaging kind of colonial text about the characteristics of, of the Malay race. Um, and then Priya on the right um, has created a kind of avatar which sort of looks at the sort of new ways of thinking about the brown body within the digital space. So it's a very beautiful and very kind of um, powerful work in that sense. Um, and then just go to the, I'll just very quickly just mention the other exhibition, which is the partner exhibition by Singapore Art Museum, just called Time Passes, which references a passage in Virginia Woolf's To the Lard House, which is a chapter of about 20 pages, but covers several decades. Um, and it's about this passing of time in a very compressed way. So a wonderful metaphor for what we're going through. Um, and just go to the next slide, I'll just finish on this one. Um, and the theme behind this exhibition was this idea of care, which I think is a term that's really come forward um, in this past six months. Um, so a number of works reflect this idea of intimacy, care, of uh, work left, um, where the, the captions Apologize, but it's it's a series of photos of um, snails. Um, we have these very large tropical snails in Singapore, which often get squashed. So she goes around and um, moves them out of harm's way. So it's this very beautiful sort of sensitive project, of, and also that sense of interaction with nature. And the diva's work in the centre is based on a Reiki studio. So this idea of touch and energy and, and connection. Um, and then the work on the right, Diana Rahim looks at what she calls hostile architecture, which are these sort of interventions into public spaces, block intimacy, so the barriers and bar and um, kind of block that are put through public space that sort of um, control. So she in intervenes in those by putting plastic flowers and fabrics and so on and really brightens them up. So a very beautiful kind of thoughtful um, response to what everyone's going through. Um, so I'll just finish there. Thank you. Thank you, Rosso. Um, just for your information, because the, the whole section of the symposium program has been delayed, so we wish we will um, wrap up and end this discussion by 1 p.m. Taiwan time. So that will be 2 p.m. Japan time and 4 p.m. Melbourne time. I hope it's fine for you if you need to run to your next online <laughs> event. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
I, I I need to leave a bit earlier because I go on to another one at one o'clock. So, right, yeah. right, sure. Um, so, um, yeah. yeah. Well, I guess there are many Thanks points to. to oh, okay, noted. Um, so I guess there are many points that we could like explore further. So, for the maybe I would just ask a, a general big question, and I think that would be uh, already enough to explore that. Since 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 each of your sector has been experiencing all this, um, you know, contradiction or no matter its force or being treated as opportunities to get uh, reconnected with other sectors and artists and the community and the uh, audiences, how would you? How each of you? How would each of you imagine for the next? maybe two to three years in the post-pandemic era, where are we going and how your curatorial practice or strategy of institutions will respond or imagine the future? You can talk about exhibition making, you can talk about art making, you could talk about the, the policy or the strategy of public program and education where um, but, but whatever um, points or layers you like to explore. Key Hong? <laughs> um, you know, I, I mean, for me personally, I don't think that's a post-pandemic world um, because, you know, I think for already a long time now, I've kind of accepted that... Um, you know, that, that there is no such thing as going back to any kind of normality that we know. And, and in fact, I think a lot of what uh, all of us have shared today, um, I don't think it's just a necessarily a, an ad hoc uh, response to the pandemic situation. I think more importantly, it has brought us into a sharper focus as to what kinds of futures we want to be part of mm. and and what kind of practices that actually addresses these kinds of futures. Mm. I, I, I think we, we're all fully aware that in the arts, you know, the, the, the level of precarity um, in everywhere, wherever we are, is something we, we don't want to go back to. Yeah, I think it's important um, you know, as institutions, we have to really, really understand, um, you know, these particular issues. And, and, and so for me, it's also a lot about reimagining resources and what is the power relationships between, say, curators, artists, audiences, and the institution. And, and I think in the next two to three years, it is really, really super important to kind of, as Emily says, to always center the art and artist in a context of radical care. Mm. Because I, I, I think more and more, you know, we, we have to understand that, you know, um, the, the lives of beings, and I don't just say human beings, uh, the lives of many, many types of beings, you know, across species, um, you know, it's, it's, it is also our responsibility um, to be in, in this context to kind of reshape what kind of futures, you know, that I think at least will, will, will give us a, a, a completely new way of doing things. So I, I think the different experiments that we've all been engaging in are clues towards that. So, so I, I think it is also in the two to three years, it's about, you know, to continue experimenting, to continue uh, accessing different types of knowledge systems uh, and thinking, not just within the art world, but, but many other uh, types of disciplines uh, um, to even communities that we want to bring everybody uh, to the same table, yeah? That, that we are kind of uh, uh, working together to rebuild, um, you know, how we want to, to be together. Yeah, I, I think particularly the, in terms of the notion of togetherness and assembly, 
I would arguably say in a very near future that the definition, the dictionary of social engagement, participatory art, something like, like, like this will be all rewritten, like how we reimagine um, in this regime or in this digital sphere and social sphere, how everything can come together again in many, in very different ways. Not, not, not like as usual or as normal as what we get used to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kihon. Mm -hmm. Erico, Emily, and or Russell, feel mm -hmm. free. Mm -hmm. Well, in Japan, I think it's already starting that the conservative swing is happening, uh, not only among the art world, but also for the uh, the political world and also the socially. Uh, the people are thinking more conservatively after the COVID situation, even before. And that's, I think that's not only for Japan, but also in the world, uh, things, worldwide things. And I think in the museum context, uh, many of the museum will do the uh, exhibition, which can be managed inside the country. So I think they will loan the works from the domestic collections or invite the domestic artists. So that kind of uh, conservative swing or I'm a little bit pessimistic about that things will happen in the near future. But also uh, many of the contemporary artists is already starting to uh, break that kind of movement. So I think both uh, sides will happen in the same way that the conservative swing and the more in the international and more networking uh, based art project will start growing in, on the other hand. So I think uh, what what the institution can support those kind of the artistic activity is kind of important things to think about in the near future. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm curious as well um, about that changing role of institutions that you've both mentioned. And I think um, for us, I think the, the critical note is not that um, the institution is irrelevant or, um, or, or not needed. It's just it, it, the role is different and it's um, mm -hmm. to, to hold and to support and to, um, to, to back and, and to be quite invisible. And we are in the process of, um, uh, we, we had a very successful festival um, for the last decade called Dance Massive. It was Australia's largest contemporary dance festival um, for a lot of reasons, but partly due to COVID. Um, we won't be able to do it in March 2021. We're just taking the opportunity to, um, to to think afresh and ask the sector what they actually want out of a festival, out of a festival for dance in Melbourne. Um, but it has required um, us to be constantly, um, in a good way, course correcting about what our role is to support the artists that are and the producers leading that process. And because we're not physically together, that, that then requires a really different kind of communication, an over-communication, constantly feeding back, constantly talking and, and really, um, and, I mean, that's probably in, extends well beyond the arts as an experience from this year. But as I'm just, I guess we're experiencing a changed way of working that artists are, are asking us for, um, which is, as we've all said, in a lot of ways overdue but it also requires this heavy amounts of feedback from all parties about what that actually looks like because I don't think, well, I, everybody has different opinions and that's as it should be, but it's not that um, the institutions, some people would say burn it all to the ground and that's valid, but others would, I think we also need to be able to um, find those opportunities within the institution for intersectional thinking, for malleability, and they're not easy, but um, it's been a fascinating time for figuring out where those spaces actually are, where the water can run around the rocks. And, um, uh, yeah, I mean, Melbourne has been um, undergoing something quite different from the rest of our country. And 
as hard as it has been, um, I do think we are the, in the best position to actually undergo some change because we're not rushing back into what was before. We've been forced to think deeply about what else. And it is time, as we're all saying, for, for, the, for the else. So, um, yeah, it's hard to say that I'm grateful. I don't think I am. <laughs> but I think it's the right work to be doing. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think one of our challenges is, you know, how we can be involved in that social space um, and then connect it to what we do with with art. And I guess, you know, Singapore has a very particular public sphere, I guess. It's very, um, I mean, the government is very involved in every aspect. And, um, you know, even these kinds of conversations, we have to be, of course, very mindful of how these conversations are run. and. Um, particularly as a major public institution. Um, there's a willingness to open up on one hand, but there's an anxiety about what that could unleash on the other. So mm. it's, it's a very interesting moment, a sort of balancing act, I guess, between what, you know, I mean, particularly younger generation, as I just showed with the artists, are really pushing for more discussions around, you know, social justice and, and, and equality and so on. Whereas, um, so I think for us, this is the, best way to do that is through the work of artists and, and through the, the concerns they have. And I mean, we had last year a major exhibition on art and society in Asia from the kind of 60s to the 90s um, called Awakenings, which also came to Japan, and um, which was a fantastic, very political exhibition, but it was sort of distanced by history. And one thing perhaps we would have done differently now is, is how to really connect that more closely to current, with the present, and how we can have, use that to have much more engaged conversations about what's going on in the world right now. Um, you know, it didn't just happen 30, 40, 50 years ago, but it's, and obviously they have impacts on today, but, you know, what are the current issues that can really be brought out through, through the works that we're showing, even if they're, you know, historical work. So this is a really interesting kind of nexus that we're trying to nut out at the moment is, is how we can bring those conversations together and and use that as a way to open up a space for for um you know some really productive and progressive kind of discussions i i i yeah in relation to this um i i i thought about that in terms of this um i don't know domestic or regional or um, partial um, connection or solidarity or radical care, like how would you imagine this kind of um, mental or conceptual space to, to um, continue in the near future? That for example, using your um, um, institutional um, strategy or resources, how would you push further to build up this, I don't know if it's called, um, you know, like between countries during the COVID-19, they, they wanted to do the domestic travel bubble, like to form a certain safe space or con uh, safe zone between some um, countries or some um, places. And in art way, how would you, how would you imagine this could happen? To in the near future, I, I think in many ways, you know, I mean, uh, all of us have existing relationships, you know, with each other, you know, with colleagues around the world, uh, with artists around the world as well. And and I think, you know, while we physically will not be traveling anywhere anytime soon, you know, it's it's also important to acknowledge and to recognize these relationships and to double down on them and to rely on each other even more, yeah? to be your eyes and ears on the ground of other artists, other practice that you may not have access to. And, and, and in that sense, you know, this is already some level of a bubble yeah? that, uh, that has, gone, has been in existence, but I think now it's even more important to rely on them. I think the other thing uh, to say that, you know, it's important to maintain the connection and the relationships and the dialogue between um, 
sort of the local context with the international. You know, I, I, I think we're not saying that we're just going to shut out, you know, what's outside. I, I think that's, that's kind of uh, um, silly. But I think then it would lead us to, to really rethink what does collaboration mean you know, mm. in, in this kind of situation. And, and, and of course, in the short interim, of course, you rely on tools like the Zoom and the Teams and the Google Meets to, to do the very basic thing. But more importantly, of course, experimentations that goes into avatars, that goes into where, you know, a, a, a local artist, you know, becomes the physical manifestation of the work, you know, together with its national uh, in your city. But I think above and beyond that, you know, what's also crucial is that then perhaps this is also the moment by which, as institutions like Emily says, we open up our doors to ask a very basic question, is what do you need? Yeah, we ask our communities, our artists, what do you need? And also perhaps to think about needs that you don't know you need. Mm. Yeah, so, so it's important to, to kind of start to operate and, and think in these ways. Yeah, mm. yeah I would firmly agree with all of that. Um, yes, I think, um, yeah, trying to understand needs um, when um, art has... I don't know what the language has been like in other countries, but there was a lot of talk about essential. There's a lot in a talk, a lot of discussion about essential services in our country. That word essential, um, that happened very early, and it was one of the many new languages that um, emerged this year. Um, but essential has become um, the framework by which we understand things, and um, it's right. It's right that as arts practitioners, we all have a, a conflicted relationship with that. I think. Um, the fantasy of the travel bubble persists in Australia. Um, we have one somewhat with New Zealand right now that is one directional and already flawed. Um, I think uh, I'm keen, I, I agree with you, I, I'm really keen for us to use our existing relationships because I feel like artists and arts workers are, are incredibly networked, densely, amazingly informed about practices happening elsewhere. and. Um, and and that puts us in actually a very powerful position to create um, better understanding. Um, it, I mean, I, I know my country travel. You know, we tend. To, I, I live amongst the people who who do travel a lot, but it boggles my mind to to imagine us isolated um, and and never connecting physically with with other countries. Um, I don't see how that's possible at the moment. Now, even within our country, we are separated. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to do to, um, we have a lot of work ahead of us to, re to reconcile the, the, the level of schism that has happened amongst communities. Um, I heard a very interesting discussion with Zadie Smith where she talked about how um, uh, we've talked, uh, pr privilege has been something that, we've, that people have um, analysed deeply as being relative and check your privilege, how are you privileged in relation to other people. But suffering is not like that. You, you, suffering is not relative at all. You know, my, the ways in which I'm suffering can't be compared to the ways other people are suffering and, um, and they are all valid. <laughs> and I think trying to understand, yeah, someone else's conditions and state play in terms of how they are experiencing and suffering in the world right now that is um, one of the jobs we have to do and so much I, yeah there's there was a great article yesterday in the guardian about um, some local artists here called the Huxleys um, who are some of the few artists who have produced work that um, I've seen that have reflected the great howl of this time the confusion the, the sort of um, the, the agony of it, the strangeness, and I, I look forward to seeing more work that expresses just how chaotic and and, and kind of um, and uncomfortable um, this this time has been for, for so many people. Um, maybe we're, I, I don't I don't know about being ready for things. You know, I, I look forward to supporting artists to to express, I guess, yeah, the difficulty of of what has occurred or is occurring. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I guess for us being quite a large institution and like any big art museum, it can be siloed. 
I mean, I agree with what everyone said about working externally, but one of the other big aspects is how we work internally and work with each other within yeah. the organisation. And that's quite shifted quite quickly, I think. I mean, obviously, isolation physically has made, put a lot of tensions, <laughs> put a lot of tensions to, you know, how we communicate, how we work together. Um, but there's new opportunities to, to collaborate, um, not only externally, but also with each other within the organisation, the team, the things who we may not usually work with. And a lot of the new initiatives that we've been developing are across divisional, uh, which is, I mean, they're always in a sense, but this is in a much more, a much deeper way, which is quite exciting, I think. I think the potential for that is, is in the way it might reshape the organisation is, is really, you know, something that we could bring out of this. Mm. I think those partnerships are going to be critical and it's really interesting to hear about that Singapore-wide partnership that you've been able to broker. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you all guys. This. But, uh, yeah, and from the public museum uh, point of view, uh, I think, yeah, I totally agree that the artists and curators and all the professionals are really network, well networked and we have knowledge to how to connect to the worldwide uh, peoples. But uh, to, it, we have to also think of, about the local audience who cannot uh, encounter something uh, without, uh, without someone's support. And in, in our city, uh, we have really diverse types of people, and uh, even in the public elementary school, uh, 15 to 20 percent of the students cannot speak Japanese well, um, so they are from the different origins. So uh, what we can do is to how we can bring uh, our museum activity to approach all those diverse types of the people who lives in Yokohama without uh, physically visiting here. Because we have uh, school visiting programs. Uh, every year we have more around 100 uh, school class, uh, school students visit our museum, but we all stopped that program this year. And but we gradually restarting those programs, but we are now thinking how we can bring our program to each schools um, inside the city from next year. And we are also thinking we the curator go outside and do some kind of lectures and introduce our collections to the local people who are a little bit hesitating to visit the museum again or uh, who cannot be able to come to the museums. So I think those kind of the different levels of the uh, communication is becoming, uh, again, it's becoming important. Mm. Right. Yeah, I mean, this, this is like a very um, stimulating um, conversation, mm -hmm. how, because I could also sense that how like each of us really approach and we think about this um, future or formation in, in in a very different way in terms of the media or the field that we are living and making and doing. And at a very, very um, few minutes before we end up this conversation, we pick up one um, online viewer's question. And please, uh, if you can check the uh, chat room, the yes the question is already here people feel vulnerable in their life during the pandemic period relatively feeling very inedible in art world i wonder if the four panel members can tell us what's the role of the art play at this time it's a very big question <laughs> yeah but i think this is a really <laughs> great moment for you know, just like the, 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 the wording that Emily and uh, Kion has said, the radical care and how the, the institution's role or, or other individual human beings' role can be um, conducted in this situation. Would you like to share a little bit?
Oh, maybe I can get started. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to start. What is the role of that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it's pretty necessary um, um, for us to... River, do you want it for an artist? You're an artist. You should... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes. Um, I guess it's very necessary to to escape from the overproducing and overworking situation. And in this way, the, 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 the essential um, point is to eat well, sleep well, and and do some exercise because we have been fucking sitting too much every day. <laughs> My waist is very sore now, for example. <laughs> yeah, okay. an artist said to me recently, um, he's had realized through all of this how much he is basically flora and he needed and that means he needs water, he needs air, he needs sunshine. Uh, and he needs to be sort of fed in in range of ways, and I thought that was it stuck with me. That's quite beautiful, and it's a, a good way to understand your mental health. But I, um, the flip side of that is that I, you know, I have been that cliche. I have made a lot of bread. I have watched, you know, I've done all those things. Um, but I am absolutely sick and tired of of tiny pleasures. I did not set out for a life of tiny pleasures. Um, I've had the privilege so far of had a, having a life full of sublime pleasures and I want to fight for the um, importance of those. And that is landscape and that is um, humanity and community, but it is also art. And um, so I guess in, when I think about what the role is to play, it's, it, uh, part of that is to continue arguing for the, for the role of extreme and big and, 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 and your heart wide open because... Um, yeah, it's also about resistance to the way that we are now, however long, long it lasts, but the resistance to the way that we are now be becoming sort of settled and ossified in, inside ourselves or accepted as the only way to be. So I think art needs to keep us flexible um, and and give those neural pathways still, you know, new, new channels to form. That's, that's my stab at that <laughs> extremely big question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I just want to add to that. Um, and I like what you just noted about the essential, because there was quite a notorious article in the national paper here about essential jobs and artists were at the very bottom. And that caused quite a, a ruckus, um, rightly so. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think art, in a sense, pushes forward the sense, uh, will make very evident the very instrumental or operational way that we're kind of things or to live around the way the politicians king and the what the being can end and, and and managed in such a intensive way that this is a vision for something better. I mean art is always a vision for of the possible. Um, you know, and and it's a, other ways of thinking, other ways of seeing, a, a new way of, of being in the world and, and that is more than ever fundamental, I think. And that grand vision for art I think is should always be looked after and cared for, and and as art you know, workers and institutions, that's something we have to fight for. Even when we're being, you know, our funding's being cut, and you know, all these other expectations and pressures are being put on us to do certain things. I think this is, should always be at the heart of what we do. I, I absolutely agree with that. I mean. You know, the, the irony is that in the midst of the, the lockdown, all of us are accessing art, right? From music to Spotify to Netflix to whatever you have, you know, it's coming out of our ears, you know. So, so to say that art is not essential is fucking bullshit, yeah? So, so you know, it's, 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 it's important, you know, like Emily and Russell is saying, you know, to protect, to really protect you know, this space that we're, that we're all operating in, you know, that, that in fact, you know, if let's say the continued existence is in the absence of art, then I, I think we're in big trouble, yeah. So, so I, in, I, 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 I kind of feel that actually, you know, for me as a response to this question is that you already know what art can do for you. Yeah, mm. yeah. I totally agree as well. 
And it reminds me of the impressive <laughs> words by the one artist who participated in Yokohama Triennial this year. And he is a jet setter and traveling all the time uh, throughout the world. And he never stops. But this time, this year, he had to stay at his home with his family. And so he had really stressful time. And then we were having the a Skype chat for almost daily. And he says, I, I think it was in mid of April or early May or something. Uh, he says he was rescued by our project. And because he can, his mind can be busy all the time thinking about his project, uh, how he can manage to do it remotely. And I also thought that as well, I was rescued by my project and my work mm -hmm. and it's not because I was so busy but uh, but also because thinking of art and discussing with the artist and uh, discussing about something of the art in the future it really rescued and I was so feel I can, I can feel really free about uh, thinking of all those issues and the art is it it can always change one's perspective. So it's, it helps thinking differently. So in this kind of situation, art really, we all really needs art, I think. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, um, for example, at the very beginning of the global pandemic uh, outbreak, I was in Paris and over the, and over the close lockdown, period of time, like people really got depressed and, you know, like no, um, no, where, no way out and no possibilities of experiencing art, no matter it's visual art or live performance again. And so suddenly when the government, um, you know, did lockdown and all the people were like just going out and then, you know, you know, can't wait to be seen together physically again and then go partying and then when the museum open up like central pompidou or in other museums like people really go and buy a ticket and never ever we have experienced this this kind of situation yeah and so at this section um this session now we are going to um wrap up and I guess I don't have any like specific wordings for to wrap up this session, and I also feel that this conversation has been just unfolded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, we are doing this section in the daytime. If it's nighttime, I guess with whiskey or glass of wine. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, well, thank you very much. I want to uh, acknowledge each of your um, contribution and generously sharing your experiences and perspective um, towards this uh, subject. And I, and I do believe that uh, around the world, like a lot of culture and art sector are also doing this same uh, similar um, symposium to bring together all the minds um, and, and perspectives together um, to, um, to together investigate or navigate, let's say, um, the possibility or the impossibility of the, the future of arts. In our ecology and so all the online viewers uh, thank you for your participation and watching um, I'm uh, my apology that uh, we couldn't answer every question however um, I guess if you want to reach out for our for or our panel members you could um, maybe follow them on Instagram <laughs> I think I do. I, I think you you guys have Instagram account, no? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so this is uh, this will be the end of the uh, morning section of the AASN um, online symposium to talk about the future. So thank you, everyone, and thank you for your participation of online viewer. Thank you, everybody. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Very See you very soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Um.
So followed by um, Xiangling Lai, the executive director of tai Taiwan Cult Contemporary Culture Labs keynote speech. Um, the section you have experienced is, is uh, the panel discussion, assembly museum and theater sector to talk about how we can go social again for this subject. Um, hope to see you next time and the afternoon session will be at the Korean keynote speech and panel discussion.